Okay, great. I'd like to welcome you to exploring Java heap dumps. Uh, in this presentation, I'm going to cover how to analyze and also find out and write code to analyze your heap dumps. Um, so a quick review for those of you that aren't familiar with Java heap dumps or haven't dealt with them extensively. All Java objects are created and stored in the heap. Um, all objects are globally reachable in the heap. Uh, the Java heap is created when an application starts up. Um, and its configuration, some of the basic settings for it are XMS and XMX, which control its initial, initial size and the maximum size that it can grow to. And garbage collection, of course, hopefully removes objects that are unreachable or that we think are unreachable. So that's the basics of the Java heap. Um, the nice thing with the heap is that it contains everything and it can be dumped to disk to be analyzed, which is where this presentation comes in. So why would you need to analyze the heap? Um, IT reports that your Java EE Spring application memory has footprint, has grown to 20 gigs, and apparently hasn't stopped growing yet, and you don't know why, because it didn't do that in testing. Application logs, when you get application logs from a client, contains little sprinklings of out-of-memory exceptions every so often. You run into problems where you have exhausted connection pools, right? So you're running out of connections to ActiveMQ or your to database, and you're not exactly sure who, who has the who has the connections to the database and why are they holding on to them and why haven't they been garbage collected. Um, you have unre unreasonably large serialized Java objects. Um, so one problem that I had to troubleshoot, I had message, object messages going through ActiveMQ and they were supposed to be between like 5 and 20 megs, but every so often we'd have a nice little wrecker that would go through the system at 200 megs. Um, you end up with uh, another reason to be perform uh, poor performance due to Java garbage collection, uh, uh, due to excessive amounts of uh, garbage collection or time spent in the Java garbage collection. So those are all the typical reasons why you need to analyze Java heaps. Um, so all you need, um, right, is a, a profiler such as Eclipse, the NetBeans profiler, you, uh, your kit, or JProfiler, right? If that was the case, you wouldn't be here and I wouldn't have put together this presentation. Um, so those tools work great if you have a textbook memory leak, you know, one with a nice little line that goes up, you get the heap dump, and you see that it's one particular type of object, and boom, you're done within a few minutes, right? Um, whereas actual production heap dumps uh, tend to be a little bit different. Um, so this is one from an application that I was working on. We have over 9 gigs worth of data that was dumped to disk. Uh, there are 13,000 class loaders, classes loaded, 136 million different instances, and 6,000 GC routes. Good luck if that thing has been growing, figuring out what the cause of the memory leak is, right? This is beyond, you know, beyond, beyond comprehensible. You can't sit there in you know, JProfile or and dig through that and try to figure out what's actually causing it. Um, so you capture the heap dump in that case and there is no smoking gun. There's no single object that's been growing out of control. You know, what exactly is going on here? You take a look at the, the heap dump in your heap, um, in, in, the, in this case in the NetBeans tool, and you've get, you're told that you've got, in one case, almost two million of one types of objects. You've got another type of object that's at 500,000, et cetera. You start digging through it, and everywhere you look, your data is valid, right? Um, so these numbers right here are, there's, there's no way that you can go through the data in a profile or in spot check things and find the cause of the memory. Like, it's, it's practically impossible in a real application dump, right? So you've got too much data. It's impossible to comprehend, and there is no human way to explore the data. Um, the application model is too complex, etc. Um, so that's, that's where heap dump panic sets in. You've got a production problem, but everywhere you look, everything looks fine, right? There's no smoking gun. There's no single point. You know, there's, you, 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 the, the graph doesn't go straight up, and it's all one type of object, right? So real memory leaks are, are typically happen like this, where we have a, data mo a relatively simple data model, and somewhere along the line, the data model gets duplicated, right? And you have not just one, one object, but you've got a graph of objects, and everywhere you look at the data, the data is valid, right? So it looks correct everywhere, that, everywhere you look. Um, so real memory leaks, the production leaks that I've had to troubleshoot have been due to uh, faulty clone methods, uh, duplicate singletons, right? You have, an app, uh, you have a class that you thought was a singleton, but somehow multiple copies of it are being banged out. Um, accidentally cached data, or caches that aren't correctly purging themselves, because the reference is held somewhere else in the code, cache logic bugs, um, and complications. So, you know, you might have a, a, a quote unquote memory leak that doesn't grow over time. The application just consumes a lot more memory than it should be consuming. Um, that you have some type of error in your data model where you're maintaining, as the application is progressing, maintaining multiple copies of a given object. 
or object graph, and then when they're, they're done with them, it gets garbage collected, so it's not a real memory leak, it's just the application is using excessive amounts of memory um, uh, due to internal bugs. So that's more of a, that's a non-trivial memory leak bug. Um, now many of the, the tools that are out there right now have um, support for query languages. So for the, the Visual VM and NetBeans, we've got the OQL, which is Object Query Language, which allows you to query the heap. So it's a SQL-like language, supports JavaScript expressions. Um, and the downsides to using this is that it's poorly documented and hard to use, and is easy, easy to create runaway queries. Um, so when I first started digging through uh, large heap dumps, I'd execute these queries. In some cases, they take four to five, six hours to execute. And after a while, I'm sitting there, you know, okay, I don't dare touch the computer, I don't dare shut it down. Is this thing actually going to complete today? Will I have my answer and ha will I find the bug? So that's the challenges with using OQL. So this is not really a solution. So the solution, of course, is the NetBeans profile, which what might be asking, I just went over on the previous slide, that this was not the solution. Um, and so the NetBeans profile, part of the Apache NetBeans project, um, the NetBeans, of course, is an open source IDE platform. It's got a clean modular architecture, and the profiler code is well structured, which means that there is a profiler uh, GUI module, and then there's also a profiler API module that you can actually use in your own code. Um, so you can actually break it out and use it. Um, so the NetBeans Profiler API, which you can use, parses HPROF files for you, um, creates an object model representing the contents of the HPROF file, um, pages the data in from disk, so if you've got a large heap dump, say you have 10 gigs, you don't have to have 10 gigs free of RAM in order to, to parse it. Um, it's got a simple API, which as you'll see in this presentation, you can master in about 10 minutes. So this is actually a, a fairly trivial API to use. Um, it, and the nice thing is that it's also independent of NetBeans, so it doesn't depend upon any other part of NetBeans, which thereby allows you to extract it out and use it on, um, your own, uh, in your own code and in your own projects. Um, so th this talk is really about how to build custom heap analysis tools using this um, to answer you know, s uh, questions that are specific to your data model and also write custom logic to analyze your data model. So now you can write logic that's going to traverse over your data model and say, okay, how many copies of this object do I have and who is referencing these specific types of instances, right? You can build up, you know, in, in, uh, basically a mirror model of your data model by, when analyzing the heap so that you can analyze it, right? As opposed to looking at lists of objects and trying to find stuff via lists. Um, so before I go into that, I'm just going to go cover quickly generating heap dumps. So there are several different ways of generating heap dumps. Um, you can pass in the command line parameter so that if you have a out of memory exception, it'll dump it automatically. There's also command line options which allow you to pass several different command line utilities that you can use, which you can pass at a PID and a heap dump will be generated or you can press control break if it's running in a console window. In addition, you can programmatically control generate heap dumps so you can actually add code to your um, to your application that will dump a heap dump if you know an anomalous situation is detected. So for instance, you could be monitoring the MBean which monitors the, um, the size of the heap. Once you hit 80%, you dump out uh, a copy of the heap to disk so that you can then analyze it. Um, so that's the basic setup code right there for it. Um, in addition, um, you can also generate a heap dump via JMX. So you can have your APM tools like AppDynamics or Dynatrace. When a problem is detected with your application, you know, the application heap is growing over time, um, you can have them automatically dump out the heap so that you can analyze it. Um, taking a heap dump, the, the couple of things to note is that it does take time, it does consume disk space, and it negatively affects the performance of an application. So it's one of those things that, you know, you have an application misbehaving in production. If you take a heap dump, you might make things, you know, pretty bad for performance-wise temporarily while a heap dump is being generated. So keep that in mind. It's not something to be done lightly in a production system where you just dump the heap because you will affect the performance and the responsiveness that the users are seeing. Um, targeted heap dumps, uh, serialized object graphs. Um, you can also do targeted heap dumps where you serialize object graphs from an application to disk, then load them in, and then create a dump for it. Um, so I've done things along these lines where I know that there's a problem with the data model in one area, so I serialize out the object graph that I know that's the problem. I then read it in into another application that doesn't have as much stuff in memory, and I generate heap dump from that so that I can analyze it, right? So I've got, you know, I know that there's some problem with this data model, I say, okay, serialize it out to disk, 
and then I read it in and then dump it. And this is how I tackled the problem with uh, messages going through ActiveMQ. I read the, I serialized the message out to disk, I read it back in, and then I dumped it to disk as a heap dump. So building the profiler. Um, so as I mentioned, the NetBeans prof we're going to use, look at using the NetBeans profiler. So the first thing, there you have two different options. Um, you can create a NetBeans platform application, or you can copy the API source out of the NetBeans source code and work with that. Um, that's the approach that I typically take. If you're building more of a reusable tool that's going to be used by other developers, you can you look at the pro platform application. Um, the nice thing is if you're copying the API source out that you can create a series of command line utilities. Um, which is what I have ended up doing in the past. I've probably bumped out somewhere along the lines of 50 of them for analyzing different aspects of the data model. Um, the NetBeans platform application is fairly straightforward. You go in, you say that you're creating a module, and then to that module you add the Java Profiler J fluid dependency, and you, boom, you have access to it. If you're going to check out and copy the source code out of the NetBeans project, um, this is the link to the Apache, um, the, uh, to the source code in Apache, and the actual profiler source code lives under NetBeans profiler lib profiler source NetBeans lib profiler heap. And it has, within that one directory, has all of the classes that you actually need to build your own profiler. So you simply copy that directory out and you're off and running. Um, so which approach? Copying the sor sources is the easiest, um, and most analysis apps end up being one-offs, right? You write the application to, to, to do some analysis of your data model, and you find out that that wasn't actually the problem. Um, also note that you don't need the class path of your application from which the heap was generated when doing this analysis, right? So you, you can, you, 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 you're working with completely offline. Um, you don't need the original source code of it, so you can actually be analyzing an application for which you don't even have the source code to it. Um, so the NetBeans Profiler API. Um, so this is basically all you need to know, and from this point right here, you can actually take this code and go from here. Um, so this is opening up a heap. So you include these two classes, um, create a heap fact, uh, use the heap factor to create a heap and read in the file, and you're off and running. Right? This is as simple as it is to open up a heap. Um, once you open up the heap, that's it. Um, and the rest of it is just act using the methods that are on that class to iterate through what's in your heap dump. So there's a number of different methods. So there's, you know, get a Java class by name. So you can pass in a fully qualified class name, and it will return you all instances of, it will return you a Java class that represents that instance. So it has a representation of that, which I'll be going over in a slide. You can get a list of all the classes that are in that heap dump. Um, you get, there's methods for getting the biggest objects by retained size. You can retrieve all the GC roots, uh, get the get instances by instance I, by ID. This is after you've started to process it. So you come across an object and you know it's being referenced somewhere else. You can say pass in the identifier and it will return back the thing that's referencing it. Um, and you can you can uh, use regular expressions to iterate through it. And you can also get summary information about the JVM that was running when the heap dump was generated. So for example, if you're after like the class path of the application command line parameters that were passed into it, et cetera, those are available via the get summary. <clears throat> so this, um, this is the code here for getting the properties that were passed into the JVM. You do heap.getSystemProperties, gets the names. You can print out the name of the properties that were passed into the application along with the command line parameters. So this is what, if you're in the NetBeans profile and you see the little panel and it tells you what the JVM was started up with, this is how it's generating that UI. Um, and then in addition, there's the heap summary object, which you can get the total number of live instances, the time, the live number of bytes, et cetera, from it all, summarization information. Um, and then starting points for analysis. So you're either going to start with classes that you're interested in, or you're going to start down with GC roots or threads or specific class types. So one of these three you're going to start with, right? So you're either going to look from GC routes because you want to figure out, okay, how are these, ob why are these objects in memory suits start at the GC route and go from there? Or you're going to pick out a particular uh, class type and then go back up to the GC route to find, GC route to figure out why it's still in memory. Um, garbage collection roots, um, so there's a specific class for this, um, is an object that is accessible from outside the heap. Um, objects that aren't accessible from a GC root are garbage collected, and they're within the NetBeans API code, there is um, several different root GC root categorizations. So, you know, a class loaded by the system class loader, um, a thread, a stack local, monitor, a JNI reference, and also something that's being held by the JVM. 
Um, so that heap object that we created before, we can call get GC roots, roots, sorry, and we'll get back a list of all the GC roots that we can then iterate over. Um, below, I have a printout from a uh, sample heap dump that I analyzed, where I've got you know 44 of them were for Java frames, five uh, thread objects, 29 JNI references, and then 1,284 with sticky class. And so the GC root object that gets returned, there's actually, you can do instances of, there's several different types of it. So there is a, um, a Java frame GC root and also a thread object GC root. And these are the constants that are provided. So the root.getKind can return these constants back from the for you. Um, really in the analysis that I've had to do, I've had to do more data model analysis, less on the GC root side. So finding a specific class, um, you can perform a lookup using the fully qualified class name. You can search by either the class ID or an instance ID. Um, the, no, the important thing to note is that IDs are unique to a given heap dump. So if you're trying to write something that's going to compare two heap dumps, you have to keep that in mind that the IDs that the, heap, that the API is going to return are going to be unique for the particular heap dump. Um, also, hash codes, because they're computed at runtime, may not be available if they were not stored in a variable. Um, so for the profiler uh, data model from NetBeans, it has this concept of a Java class. There's actually a, uh, a class called Java class, and that represents the Java class. And then there are instance classes, which are instances of a Java class. So if you ask for the heap for give me java.lang.string, it's going to return back a Java class. From the Java class, you can say give me a list of all of your instances, and you can then iterate over them. Um, so this is the inheritance hierarchy um, where we have uh, Java class extends type. Um, there's also primitive types are split out a little bit separately. Um, so when you go to just realize when you're analyzing objects, you're going to have to do, you're going to end up with this code to do a lot of instances of. So is it an instance of a primitive type or not? Um, and then instances um, from an instance, you can find out who references the instance. Who does the instance reference itself? You know, what other what pointers to other Java objects does it have? Um, and you can perform an instance of to find out whether it's an object array or a primitive, of, primitive array. And you can also execute and ask, you know, find me your GC root, right? Which can take an extremely long amount of time if you have a complicated data model. Uh, so with an instance, you can then write code. So it just becomes a tree processing problem at that point. So you get your instance, and you can say, okay, who has references to me? Or, you know, who are my references? So you can go either way, right? You can, you, have, you get a particular instance back, and then you want to find out who's it connected to. You can drill down that way. Or you can find out who's referencing your object and drill back up, right? So very often when I'm doing heap analysis, I, have a, I find some objects that I'm interested in, and then I'm trying to find out who actually references them within the heap. Or how do I get back to this point? So I have a known point that I want to get back to. How do I get back to that point? Right. Um, there's also this uh, value object. Um, so if you ask for instance for its references, you're going to get a list of values. And it's either going to be, and the values you're going to have to do an instance of to find out whether it's a field value, an array item value, whether the object is stored in an array, or it's a field in another object. Right. So there you'll have to, a little bit of indirection depending upon who references it. Okay. Um, so this example right here, I get, I retrieve a specific class. Um, net.kubrick.sample.office.person, and I want to print out its, the contents of its member variables. So the first thing that I do is I retrieve the class, which gives me a Java class back. I then ask that Java class for its list of instances, and then over that list of instances, I iterate over and I get their field values, the actual member variables, and what their values are. Right? Now, if anything that I'm referring, if anything that I'm printing out is an object, I'll just get, it'll print out, you know, that this is an object. Then I'll have to drill into that object to get the actual value. But this is ex extremely powerful, um, being able to loop over something this way. Um, I can also get a list of static variables. So if the object has static variables, I can loop over the static variables. Um, and this is an example here of references. So I have this, I, I retrieve back all the person objects that are in the heap dump, and I want to find out who's actually referring to them. Is it in another object, or is it in an array, is it in, in a array object, in another object, etc. So using this code, I can loop over and find out who's referencing my object. 
Um, now, it gets a little bit tricky because remember, you're dealing with heap dumps. So uh, strings, if, if you retrieve back, you know that a, a value of an object is a string. When you retrieve it out, it's not actually, you're not going to be easily, you have to write code that's actually going to process the string because what's actually, been, what's actually in the heap dump is the actual contents of the string object, right? Um, so you have a member variable that is a string. Um, you're going to then have to drill into that Java class to get its value. So the value of a string is actually encoded in the value array, right? So this, this is the code that would extract the value of a string. So you have your, your person object that has name attribute on it. You want to get the string out of it. You drill into it. You're going to have to drill, drill into the actual data structures themselves, right? The same thing for linked lists. So you have your... You have a linked list that's in one of your objects. You want to find out you know, what, what its contents are. You're going to actually have to go through, look at the source code for linked list, and understand how it's going to be structured in a heap dump. So there's going to be a, even though this is marked as transient because you're generating heap dump, it's going to be there. So you'll, have, you'll start with the first and then have to write code that's going to iterate through the actual data structure of the linked list to get the values out of it. Um, so with a linked list, it's actually there's actually a node a node class that it maintains with the item and then the next uh, next and previous items. So you actually have to drill into this when you're writing code that's going to analyze heaps. Right. Um, this is a linked list extracting the contents of a linked list, assuming that I don't have to dig down into those objects any further. Um, array list, same type of deal, except it's nice that it's got this nice little object array. So linked uh, array lists are much easier to process than linked lists. Once again, you just get, for the uh, array list, you get the element data from it, and then you can iterate over the values and drill down into them. Okay. Thread extraction, you get the list of java.lang.thread instances, and you can loop over them. Um, you can also take the approach of going through GC, root, GC uh, roots and looking at thread object GC roots. Um, so you've got two different approaches that you can take for analyzing threads within your application. Um, when analyzing heaps, um, one thing I had to do is I had to filter out internal JVM classes. So you'll have a lot of internal JVM classes that are in the heap dump. When you're doing your own analysis of your data model, you're going to have to filter these out. So a bit of a Java puzzler here. I took a heap dump of an application and asked for how many instances of Java line dot object there were, and there were 231. Um, and of those 230, um, all but one of them were referenced by other objects. Now, I haven't dug in into any further, but this was just a Java heap that I fired, a uh, Java command line application that I fired up that didn't do anything, generated a heap dump, and I've got 231 object instances in memory, of which one of them was referred to by 822 other objects. So you can find out all kinds of, there's all kinds of interesting questions that you can ask about your applications and things to explore, even if your application is fairly simple. So looking at a demo application, so I have a demo application um, which represents an office, right? I've got a cube, an office, and a person. Um, and I've not drawn it using the typical UML where you have, you know, lists between them because remember, when you, when you generate a heap dump, your um, hash sets, arrays, uh, vectors, et cetera, are actually dumped out with it and you actually have to iterate over those parts of the data model. Um, so in this case, for this demo application, I create um, an office with a bunch of cubes, bunch of people in them, and then I generate, I dump the heap, and lo and behold, it's, I think, two gigs by default. There's over, so that, that previous slide right here, so this block of code, when you dump this out to disk, generates a, a file size of 3.2 megabytes. Um, we've got a total of 1,400 classes that have been created, 24,000 instances, just from that simple application, um, four class loaders, and so then the question is, how do you dig through this? So you open it up, and of course you see that most of the data is character data, no surprise. And I can start writing using the NetBeans Profiler API. I can start writing code that says, okay, I want to iterate over all the classes that start with net.cuprac. I want to pull them out. I want to print out, you know, what, you know, print out their properties, etc. cetera. Um, so this line of code right here um, will print out that there are uh, 5,159 strings in the heap dump, and that 15 of them are associated with my data model itself, right? Okay. Um, this is another example right here, so I can loop over a string utilization and try to trace back the different strings that are in the heap dump to my individual objects, 
right? So I can figure out for the person object, these are all the strings that are associated with it. For the office object, that those are all the strings that are associated with it. Right. So this gives this is extremely powerful because now you can write questions and dig through your heap dump. So if you generate a heap dump and you've got different you know, strings that are in memory and you want to know who's referencing those strings, why do they exist, you can now answer those questions. Um, any, any, anything that's in your heap dump, you can drill through and figure out how. Now, in the analysis that I've had to, had to do with these different things, because I had somebody also at the same time looking through the heap dump in the, in the NetBeans profiler, I discovered that in order to find you know, the originating object, in some cases, it required iterating through 10,000 different objects in order to trace its path through the heap. Um, so let's uh, introduce a, a leak into it. So here we make a change to the office object to, you know, to fire an employee to remove it. And we fire the employee down below. And so in the heap dump that we generate, um, we would expect Adam not to be there. Sure enough, when we would do the analysis, take a heap dump and then do the analysis, we discover that Adam is indeed still there. So how we're going to, you know, where, where is this bug coming from? And that's where this code and the profiler API come into play. Um, so I can loop over Adam and figure out, okay, so, you know, what instance, it, what instance has it? And lo and behold, in the source code, I find out that I have a person object that wasn't, uh, wasn't being cleared out. So that's how that string got back in. So even though my application ran correctly, there was still a leak within the data model where it was holding onto an object that wasn't expected. Using the NetBeans profiler, profiler API, you can write custom tools that, that understand your data model to find problems with your data model, right? So be best practices for using this API, uh, be, uh, be mindful of your heap, cache analysis on disk, um, cache analysis on disk where processing large heaps. Um, in my case, when I was working with heaps, I'd often have to have code that would write out, write out bits of information to the disk and then pull them back in um, as needed just because I was analyzing such large heaps with such large amounts of data. Um, heap processing is I.O. bound. Um, not all pro and the other thing to note is that not all profiler calls are the same. So you have to look at the Java doc because some of them will have a speed of normal and other ones will warn you that they're going to take an extremely, amount, extremely long amount of time because it has to go through and search the entire heap, right? So you get into, you get into a, a problem where you're, you end up having to cache data, cache it off on disk, but then you have to be mindful as to how long it takes to actually process that data. Um, so maintain a list of processed objects because you can end up running in circles during your analysis. You can have very complex object graphs that have cycles within them that you don't realize. Um, exclude JVM internal classes from your analysis and revisit your graph algorithms. So I put this older book up here which has a lot of good um, tree algorithms in it which become very useful when you're doing this type of analysis because you really do get into how long does it take to iterate through that tree and different ways of doing that. Um, so in summary, heap snapshots can be easily explored and analyzed. It is trivial to do this. Um, it is an excellent way of verifying your lo application logic because there is no truer test than what was actually in memory. Um, and you can use this to identify deep data model or logic errors where you can find duplications of your data model in memory. Um, you can also use this to recover data. So if you have an application that has seized up or frozen, you can take a heap dump of it and then use these tools to actually extract the information that's captured within the heap dump to actually restore that information. So if you have an application, it's on the user's desktop, it's got critical information and you need to get it out of there, you can use this NetBeans API to, to analyze that heap dump to pull the data out. And so finally, this is my, um, uh, in summary, my how to contact me if you have questions afterwards. And I'm also working on a, a JUnit extension to actually bring this into testing where you could specify what you expect to be in memory and then check to make sure your application actually had that in memory, right? So there's to, to check to see that if your data, the data model that you thought you created is what actually got, is what actually got created. Um, in the case of many of the problems that I had, that I had, to, that, that I mentioned that I had to solve earlier, where I had a 200 meg message, when I tried to load that into the target application and analyze it, everywhere I looked, none of the APIs reported any problems with the data model. It wasn't until I did this analysis that I was able to find that. Um, so thank you, and that's the quick, quick tour of how to analyze heap dumps quickly and easily. So if there's any questions, 30 seconds left, no questions. Yes.
Um, no, not yet. I've not tried that with J Shell, but it should be possible to do that. That's a good suggestion. I hadn't thought of actually doing that yet. Yeah, so that's that's where you know I've I've actually written adapters to dump the thing into other systems so that I can actually analyze it, in using other tools. So this is this this API provides a starting point for analyzing the heap. Then you can dump it into other tools and use those other tools for doing analysis. So this this is just the starting point. Yes. Uh, can, we, <coughs> can we avoid loading from the heap in memory? You don't. This this API doesn't load the entire heap in memory. So as you ask for a class, it spool looks out on disk and retrieves it. Yep, so this, this API is very nice in that you don't need 10 gigs of RAM in order to load it. And there's different parts of it that so you can pre-cache it. The thing to be careful about is that when you're writing your analysis application, you don't inadvertently end up caching the entire thing in memory as you build out your own data structures. Um, not, I'll, I'll try posting some of that. There's not one that's out there right now. Um, and if, however, if you look through the NetBeans source code, which I listed earlier, um, that package is actually very small and they have all of the utilities in there. So you'll be able to find everything within there relatively quickly. No, that's the nice thing of this API is you don't have any dependent, the NetBeans profiler API has no dependencies on anything else. So, so that there's literally one directory, you copy that out and you're off and running. That's what's so cool about this is that it's so easy to work with, to build your own tools. Okay, thank you.